Hey guys, you ever been thinking with your practice, is there an easy way to summarize how we look at marketing success? Maybe a few acronyms or a few recipes or a few things that I can just look at and see if we're on track or off track. Well, if you're thinking that today you're in luck because I got one of my good friends, Zanya Winans from Golden Proportions Marketing, who is my marketing coach. And we're going to be talking about what makes a successful marketing acronym and some of the formulas you might want to look at. So don't miss this. Grab a pen and hit the share button. You're going to love this. Hey guys, welcome to the Best Practices Show. My name is Kirk Barron and I'm your host today. So I'm so excited to have you here. And if you're joining us for the first time, you're in for a treat because I wanna welcome you to a very inviting community. We are just here to help you with any questions you have and bring on great key opinion leaders like Zanya today. You'll absolutely love her so that you can create a better practice and a better life. Now, again, if you're joining us for the first time, I want to do a couple things. Number one, I want to invite you to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. So if you're listening on like Spotify right now, just go below to the subscribe button. You can hit the subscribe button. So wherever you consume podcasts, you can keep come keep coming back, show up, and uh, every single week you're going to see I'm going to bring you a brand new key opinion leader, great thought leader in dentistry to help you answer some of the questions that you have. So don't miss out on that. Also, if you haven't joined our Facebook group, make sure you join the Facebook group. Join us over there. During the COVID conference, we just created it as a support effort where people could show up, help each other. You know? mm -hmm. Um, dentist helping dentist. This morning, we did a morning huddle on it. So it's great because you can get a lot of help from other people that are in the same boat. So join us over over 13,000 of you have joined us there. And then also too, you're going to see if you're struggling with your practice in any respect, join us over at actdental.com. You can join Act Dental U. Um, if you have struggles with your practice, you just need coaching. Heck, if you just need somebody to talk to, join us over at actdental.com where you're going to see all the resources you need to create a better practice and a better life. And I'm surrounded by amazing coaches who we're just here to help you in any way that we can. So uh, make sure you join us over there. And then lastly, we take a lot of show notes here. So uh, after you either see the video or listen to the best practices show, on wherever you consume podcasts, make sure you come back to the actual episode and you're gonna see all of our writers take all this information. So Zanya's gonna give us, like, this is my treatment plan for today. Like she's got it. Like, so you're gonna see the writers are gonna take all of what she says and put all the links in place. So if you have questions, even for myself or Zanya, you'll see Zanya's email address in there, her company, which is phenomenal all the links i'm going to make learning super easy you can just swipe up to the show notes click on the show, show notes it'll take you right there and off we go now i want to introduce my guest zanya i know you i my team loves you 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 know you coach us on a lot of things like i consider you a valued friend in dentistry for so many different things like number one you're a straight shooter number two um you're 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 a great coach for us on marketing you also coach a lot of our practices on the marketing aspect of things and i want to say one thing before you tell your story a little bit and it's kind of the same thing i say about you all the time i've been doing this for 25 years wow that's a long time that there are people that come and go in marketing like we'll be at a conference walking on the floor and a brand new dental marketing company will be here and you'll be like oh wow that's so cool and then you come back to the same conference a year later like where are they and they're like they're gone i'm like already so you've stood stood the test of time you're always there and i love what you guys do for you and i actually got a great text from a good friend of mine Dennis in Kansas City who works with you and he's like thank you so much she's awesome so you already know who that is but um 
So I know who you are. Uh, a lot of our listeners know it, but if somebody doesn't know who you are, we're going to get into the acronyms for marketing success, but who are you and what is Golden Proportions? So who am I? It's like the question of the day. Um, <laughs> I am the owner of Golden Proportions Marketing. We are a full service dental marketing agency, very strategy driven. Uh, but one of the great things about us that I think really differentiates us is I have a team of 27, I think people, it, it keeps growing, I keep losing track, that they do everything in house so that you only have to talk to one agency, one company for everything that you need when it comes to marketing. And I am personally married to a dentist, so quite literally living and breathing what you guys go through and can give some real life perspective to it. And uh, like you, I've been doing this for, gosh, marketing for 30 years and had the agency for 20. So there is nothing about dental marketing that I don't know. I would second that. Like there is, I mean, a lot of our tough questions go to you. And today we're going to be talking about some of the aspects in marketing. Now let's talk about the why before the how. When you talk about acronyms for practice success, it's really important to simplify this as best you can this year. And now, again, we're shooting this. It is currently February. What a great time to get your head around the markers for success. So let's talk about why having acronyms or frameworks for success in marketing are so important. Well, because doctors, I think, get really excited about the, uh, I don't want to call them the shiny objects, but the, the beautiful pictures that they see, the gorgeous new website that a friend of theirs has, or somebody's um, incredible postcard or whatever they're seeing in terms of other people's marketing. And they think it's all about the image. And the image is like this much of it. And yes, your image is important. It's your brand. It's how you're communicating what makes you amazing. But when it comes down to it, you have got to know your numbers. Marketing, 50% of it is the pretty stuff, but the other 50% is knowing the hard data, the acronyms, as I call them, of success, your KPIs and your CPLs and your CPAs, which we'll talk about all these things. But if you don't know your numbers, you can improve them. You have no idea if you are spending your money efficiently or just throwing it down a hole. And the numbers are literally everything for marketing success, in my humble opinion. Right, right. And so mar you know, marketing numbers or any numbers take away the, the emotion and things. And myself included more than any, bright, shiny objects. So I still got my squirrels here. Let me see if I got them. So here they are. So Zanya sends me a box one day. You guys, some of you heard the story. A box with all these squirrels and a rubber mallet. Actually, I have that right here. So she's like, okay, stop chasing shiny objects. And let me explain that. It's because like when I see something, I'm like, oh, is that cool? Oh, is that cool? No, you got to stay focused. And when you've got numbers, they don't lie. They tell the whole truth. They tell you what's going on for the most part. And so let's start breaking this down. When you talk about numbers, like what is a number? What's an acronym? What's your favorite one? And where do we start? Well, I guess my favorite one is, is just the acronym KPI because it stands for Key Performance Indicator. So a lot of practices are already measuring certain things in the practice right now. They, they just don't necessarily think of them as KPIs. They're measuring their gross production, their adjusted production, their collections, um, their reappointment rate. But there's some great marketing KPIs that I think need to be measured as well. One is obviously new patients. But the other one is a new patient reappointment rate and understanding that by the source that drove the patient in, because there is a huge amount of money that is wasted when I see practices do marketing where they're just getting a ton of leads and a ton of people in the door and they think it's incredibly successful, but they're only shoppers. They're coming for a special and they disappear. They don't come back for that second appointment. And it, while your cost per lead might be small, your cost of acquiring that patient all of a sudden got really, really expensive because they're not staying in the practice. Wait, 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 wait. I get 400 new patients a month though. You know, like why would I, you've heard all this. So <laughs> I get 400 new patients a month. I'm like, that sounds horrible. Okay, first of all, like half of those people don't even show. Mm -hmm. What did it call? Most of them probably came from a postcard, whatever. Now I'm, I'm being tongue in cheek on this, but go back to the new patient reappointment. Why is that such go a little bit further? Because this is powerful. If you can keep track of this and it's crazy how many people don't pay attention to it, right? 
uh, actually very few people pay attention to it. And this is why I love this number. So you're, you're exactly right. I have um, a great memory from probably about 10 years ago at a conference, there was somebody at the, you know, lecturing about marketing and they were going off about how excited they were with the success that they had because they had a $0 new patient exam and x-rays and the phone was ringing off the hook. And they were incredibly pumped up and excited about the results they were getting. This was not something we did. Um, and when we really kind of stopped to look at it and think about it down the road, it was one of the biggest wastes of money they ever could have done. Because if you do not get that new patient to reappoint, to come back to your practice, often the cost of their first visit can be more expensive than the cost to acquire the patient. So if you don't get them to come back, you're literally going to have a negative return on investment for that particular patient, which is crazy. So it needs to be not just volume, but like a really high quality patient. And the other reason in my mind, the average patient stays in a practice a good 10 years. If you can just do that one thing, that very first appointment to get them to come back so that you can start to, to build a relationship and build value, that is where your ROI comes from because it is the patient continually adding more revenue to the practice every single year. And it just makes it better and better and better when it comes to ROI. You have got to get that new patient reappointed. Totally. Now, I, I know it probably depends on different practices, What? but any, do you have a, a ballpark or a neighborhood which would be a good percentage on new patient reappointment numbers? Well, honestly, I'd love to see 100%. I, that might not be realistic, but the practices that we work with, it's really high. It's got to be 90 to 95% or more. And the only time that somebody isn't reappointing is because they're just not like a culture match. The personality doesn't fit or um, they just had a different expectation about what their visit was going to be like because we bring in quality patients and the doctor spending time with them. And it's not a rushed visit where you're just getting them in and getting them out in order to be efficient as possible. So that's where you get that return on investment. I think it needs to be that high. I mean, Kirk, you tell me, what do you see with the practices that you coach? Are they hitting those numbers? Yeah, I want to see them at least be higher than 75% because of the new patient acquisition number. Now, also too, you don't have to make this super complicated. Sometimes you just got to tether the patient to the practice. And let me explain. You work so hard to get the patient in, they go through a comprehensive exam, but they don't have a hygiene appointment. So your front desk person calls them over and over and over and stalks them because you presented a $12,000 treatment plan. And now both people are embarrassed to talk about the number or the dentistry. What you don't understand is like, maybe they weren't ready at the time to hear this. And it's a simple discipline. When you put it in place, people go, that's crazy. Like, I don't care what your philosophy is. You don't have to have them see them at the same time, but just make sure they're appointed so that they remember retention is a big piece of this. So don't get, don't get me started on this one. No, nope, not with you. I love this because you know, it's the same conversation over. People are always looking at how many new patients they get. Well, how many, exactly. You know, they get all caught up like their success only exists in how many times the phone rang and how many new patient appointments they got. But if you are not reappointing them, they're not quality leads or there might be something else going on in the practice that is an indication of something you need to adjust. Totally. Totally. What's another acronym for marketing success that you consider important in, in a growing practice? Well, we mentioned them a little bit earlier and it's a CPA and a CPL. So CPL is your cost per lead. Now a lead does not equal a patient. A lead is anything that gets somebody to respond. So a lead, they filled out a form on your website. They picked up the phone and made a call. They had a chat with you online. Um, they walked in your door because they happened to be walking past your practice and they had a question. That is a lead that is not a qualified patient. So your cost per lead is always going to be lower or should be lower than your cost of, um, I'm sorry, your cost per lead should be lower than your cost of acquisition because you're not going to close 100% of those leads. So you have to measure because you're gonna have a really different cost of acquisition, for example, for a website versus a television commercial. 
You know, it's just going to depend on the volume of people that you drive. But if you are not measuring that and you find out that you're spending eight, nine hundred dollars just to acquire a lead, that's crazy expensive, not efficient and marketing that you should get rid of. Right. And so the reason behind this, I mean, figuring out what that number is, you know how to adjust your spending or investing, whether it become Google ads or anything like that. The cost per lead, that's huge. That's absolutely huge. Um, the question also, I'm going to play devil's advocate. Okay. I totally agree with what you're saying. How the heck do I determine cost per lead? Okay. I have a hard enough time utilizing Dentrix. You know, if I'm a dental office, mm -hmm. we're just trying to figure out how many active patients we are. Now you're telling me that I got to figure out cost per lead. How do I, how do I figure that out? Well, it does take a little bit of math and someone doing some homework. So you almost have to add together everything that you're doing to generate a lead from a particular marketing source. So let's just say your website because everybody has a website. So there are a lot of different ways they can be a lead. So you take how many chats you had this month on your website. You take how many uh, people filled out a form and emailed it to you. How many people went right to your online scheduling and direct scheduled a new patient appointment? That's a lead. How many of them tracking phone numbers? Tracking phone numbers are everything. If you have a new patient tracking line, that tells you if it's a lead. And here's the difference, especially when it comes to the phone. I count a lead as any time that the phone rang and it was a new patient opportunity, not, you know, so for example, if your um, phone isn't getting answered and the call goes to voicemail, I'm sorry, it's still a new patient opportunity. So it's still a lead. Unfortunately, we know that 75%, sometimes up to 80% of people who get your voicemail are hanging up and not leaving a message. So your cost per lead can be really, really high if you're not taking advantage of all the leads that you're you're getting in there. Right. You gotta no. add all those up. And then and then the math. Sorry, since you asked about the math, it's really just a matter of saying, okay, how many total leads did I get this month? And you divide that into your cost of the actual marketing and it gives you your cost per lead. Pretty simple. But if you're not measuring it, you have no idea how any given piece of marketing is performing. Yeah, but Tanya, you, you, I don't need to measure this. We get all of them. We get all the phone calls. <laughs> now I'm having fun, but you hear this all the time. Like, no, 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 we answer all the phone calls. We get them all. Like, Well, our patients always leave messages. People leave messages for us. Right. I hear that all the time. Well, sure, you're hearing the ones who bothered to leave a message, right. but you have no idea how many people are calling and just hanging up. Unless you have a call tracking number, or I know there's great technology out there like Weave and some of the others that will give you missed call alerts. So that is another way for you to see those opportunities. But you gotta call those people back really, really fast because they're on a mission to check something off their list. And if it's not your practice, if they can't get a hold of you, it's gonna be somebody else's. Oh, for sure, for sure. And a lot of our practices, you set them up on this whole, like when you call, I'll even call a few of them. Uh, most, I like to call everybody on their cell phone, but like we call a practice, boom, I get a text right back from saying, hey, we are on the phone. Do you mind if I call you right back? I'm like, oh, that's so nice. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Type of a thing. So that's one thing. The other thing too, I just, I want to totally support what you're seeing here. So if you're a dentist watching this, you know how this is. You have Nancy. Nancy works at the front. She actually came with the practice that you purchased. You're afraid to talk to her because she knows all these patients. What is helpful to both of you? This isn't like a big brother. I got to watch or micromanages. When we have data, we can work together on a better solution for the practice. I can see how many calls were made. I can see how many were answered. I can see how many were converted, all that. And we're not looking for perfect. I know you and I are going to be talking about perfect or ideal, but sometimes we just got to have progress. So if we're at, 50%. Let's go to 55%. And every little patient that we sprinkle into the schedule helps that much more. So I love this. I love it. Why are, why are doctors so resistant to the numbers thing? Like sometimes is it because you tell me. Cause it's accountability. Somebody yeah. is basically that whether it's a phone call or your marketing agency or, or anything else, you have to actually face the reality and that's typically going to require change. And a lot of people are really uncomfortable with change. So they're doing all these subconscious things 
to veer away from the change that they know they're going to need to make in order to be more successful. And, and you're right, you know, it's not about looking at every number and saying, am I doing this perfectly? It's a matter of measuring the number because one of my favorite phrases is what you measure, you improve. It's almost subconscious. It's like if you have a set of numbers and you're recording them every single month, how many new patients I get, my cost of acquisition, my cost per lead, um, my ROI on my marketing, I promise you the ones that look like, gosh, we could be doing a whole lot better, your attention gets laser focused there. And almost even without thinking about it, you find ways to improve it. Don't you agree? I mean, you have KPIs. Oh, I totally agree. I would completely support your statement. And I even added, I don't know, we didn't add it. I heard it from somebody else. What gets measured gets improved, but what gets measured and reported on significantly improves. So it's one thing to report on something, but it's another thing or another, it's in one thing to measure, but it's another thing to report on it. When you know you're reporting on, I mean, if, if, if I was your kid coming home and I go, yeah, got a C minus again, you go, okay, not, you know, C minus today, not next week though. Like we got to, let's talk about a B minus, then let's get it to an A. And it just creates a, a certain inertia in the universe. A good, you, you use the word accountability. Most people that are good at anything, they love accountability. You know, they love knowing a number and, you know, somebody that's responsible in a practice, just say, do you want to be successful at this? If they say yes, go, okay, this number has got to go up eventually. If they say no, that's a bad hire. But so, you know, like it's, it's one of those things you gotta, you gotta find a way to say, Hey, look, let's be accountable. And let me just say this. What if your kids went to a school that didn't give grades? Like, how long would you tolerate that? How's my boy doing? Yeah, he's good. I gave him a star. I, I don't want a star. Like, how's he doing? Or what if you went to your cardiologist and they go, you look fine. There's no need to measure anything. You're fine. Like, you look good. You've been eating good? Yeah. You've been running? I'm good. You're good. We'll see you. You'd go, I need a new cardiologist. So I think it's really important that we we talk about the numbers. And you do learn a lot, too, mm -hmm. as you these numbers. So... Keep going. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm <laughs> We're jumping all over each other. I, I love what you're saying about the reporting on it because we all need, and again, the reporting is kind of the accountability. So if you have a team meeting once a week, once a month, and different people in your practice can be responsible for different numbers, it's not like you, the doctor, has to be the one getting every single number that's out there. Um, and the idea is, somebody publicly is holding you accountable to this because when we all see it together, we can't make excuses for it. We can't ignore it. And in, in my experience, this is one of the best things that a coach does for a practice is they kind of get to be like the teacher or the parent looking at your report card and saying, hmm, we could be doing a little bit better here. What do we need to do to improve your study habits or whatever it is in your practice? Because if someone isn't looking over your shoulder, you're going to make a lot of excuses for why something is the way it is, because we just don't want to change. We need that pressure from somebody else. Do you agree? Totally agree. That's why you put a lot of pressure on us on Tuesday mornings. <laughs> and, you know, you talk about the accountability. I, I say this all the time. One of my favorite things and the, the aspect of having a coach is critical. Like you say this to, so you did this Tuesday morning. Okay, Kirk. You were supposed to do X, Y, Z. Did you get it done? I'm like, mm, I actually feel the pressure before the call to get it done. And it's a very healthy pressure. In the end, it's this. I used to think everything is important. It's not. There's a few simple things in your practice that make a dramatic impact. Your challenge is figuring out what they are. And that's what we're talking about today. And hiring an expert or somebody that's got the ability to see through the trees, because there's things you talk about in marketing. I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, I'm like, that sounds crazy cool, but it would take me hours and hours and hours to research that. Like that's, so I agree. And I, I don't even think I answered your question, but you got to have an accountability partner in some respect, other it, or, or we're just talking. Exactly. And like a really good accountability partner, what I find coaches do really well, I know your coaches do a lot of this. There's so many numbers you can measure that you can get like completely overwhelmed in all of the data and not know where to focus. 
And often it's like Chinese water torture in terms of I'm trying to improve this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. And it's too much. Right. So we are big proponents of the critical few. Yes. So the critical few is your team, you and your team, doctors, establishing what is most important. What's an example of success for this particular metric, this KPI? Where are we now? And then let's determine which one of these will have the biggest impact on us meeting our goals for this year. Right. You can't improve everything all at once. You should be picking like two or three and go all in on fixing those numbers. You're going to see it everywhere once you start to focus like that. Amen, sister. So I'm going to totally support what she said. Every morning, I won't even show you what's on this. <laughs> I pull out a clear sheet and on the front, it's got my critical few, our few priorities. I used to have 92 priorities. Now there's four this quarter. March 31st is the end of our quarter, which is my birthday. So I got we got to get four things done and we're really only tracking our major critical few numbers. And then my team will say this, stick to the sheet. Just stick to the sheet. Stop. Where? What are we talking about, Kirk? Where is it on the sheet? I'm like, okay. So it's really important. It helps you. It helps your team. helps everybody. Love what you're saying. What else should we put in our critical few when we're talking about acronyms for marketing success? Um, so the other one is the cost per um, acquisition in terms of new patients. So you got your cost per lead. How many people picked up the phone or sent in um, a, a form or whatever that is. But what really, really matters when it comes down to it is the cost of acquisition. So acquisition is acquiring that patient, getting them in the practice. And that's a matter of looking at ultimately, maybe I had 50 leads, but only three of them converted. So my cost of acquisition is gonna be really, really high. And once you start to know those numbers and you can compare your cost per lead to your cost of acquisition, you're gonna to start to see, is my marketing just generating a lot of unqualified people? I mean, that it's typically either that, or there's a problem with the front desk not knowing how to convert the leads. But it instantly tells you when you see these big gaps, you instantly know, I either need to fix my marketing message and the type of people I'm bringing in, or I gotta have a conversation with the front desk. Right. Usually it's a little bit of both. Yeah. Now I love the acquisition cost. I'm going to ask you two questions and you can say, I always want to know what a healthy number is in acquisition costs. And you've taught me this from years ago. Once you find out what your acquisition cost is, you can see if it's healthy and then you can actually set the bar for yourself. You can say for every dollar, I want this back. Or now you can start doing some metrics on how we combine these numbers, right? So let's go back to the acquisition. So what's a healthy acquisition percentage? Well, uh, well it's not acquisition percentage, it's cost of acquisition that really matters, but it's gonna vary so much. If you're just trying to get general dentistry patients in the door, your cost of acquisition is probably gonna be in the neighborhood of, and I know this is gonna sound high, 40 to $60. Um, and that's if you got a good volume of people coming in. That's pretty typical. But if you're trying to bring in patients who are doing all on for um, implant marketing or you're doing big cosmetic cases, your cost of acquisition is going to be crazy high by comparison. But these patients are worth more. So ultimately, the last number that we have to look at is ROI. And I guarantee you, that is the thing that drives people to pick up the phone to call us every single time, even if they don't know that's what it is. They're frustrated that they don't know how their marketing is working, if it's working. Was my investment worth it? So if you are not measuring your ROI, your return on investment, and you don't have a really good handle on it, it's, it's just a guessing game. That's a crazy way to spend a lot of money for marketing. You know, I've never been there where you just throw a bunch of money at marketing. You know, <laughs> you say, oh, a new website or a Facebook ad or something. And you're like, oh my gosh. And this is where you can start to take the craziness out of, because answer this, once you get the foundationals of what you're trying to do, you can turn this into some science, right? I mean, that's where we're headed. It's not completely a guessing game or art. Obviously, you're going to combine both, but you want to move more to the science side of things in marketing, correct? Absolutely. I mean, everybody, again, they think of marketing as pretty pictures, but 
It's about what happens on the other end. And marketing is a math game. If you can figure out your cost of acquisition and you know how many new patients you want and you know what it costs you to get those leads and what your conversion percentage is, you can figure out literally what your marketing budget needs to be. You can basically math it backwards. And, and I don't have a great example for you to, to do right now. I'd have to have a spreadsheet in front of me. But you can create absolute predictability in your marketing over time. This isn't right. something that happens overnight. It's like a continual refinement. But yeah. then you got the secret sauce. Yeah, ab absolutely. Now, I want to ask you about ROI, though. Like, can you measure ROI on things besides marketing? Like yeah. new employees, new tech, new training, like anything, like, you know. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's relatively easy. The whole point of ROI is, was this investment of time or money or whatever worth it? So like, let's say you add somebody new to the front desk and it's an extra $60,000 that you weren't spending before. You can very easily look at for a comparable period of time, here's how much revenue we generated for the previous 12 months before this person came on. Here's how much revenue we generated since this person has been added. You look at the cost of them. You look at the increase in value that you've gotten. So the, the proper ROI formula, by the way, which most people think is, here is the value of what my marketing has generated um, divided by the cost of the marketing itself or say the, the new employee. And it's not, it's that divided by the cost of the marketing or the new employee. Again, it, it basically reduces your ROI by a power of one because you have to account for it as if I didn't even spend the money in the first place. So you can absolutely do that with a new employee. If you find that your uh, production went up $300,000, you do that $300,000 divided by um, the cost, I'm sorry, minus the cost of that $60,000 employee and then divide it again by that $60,000 employee. And you're going to have, I believe, like a 500% ROI. Absolutely. Measure your new employees, measure your new technology. It'll let you know if it was worth it. Okay. So now I'm, I'm totally picking up what you're putting down. I'm going to measure it. So after this podcast, I'm a dentist. I'm going to say, and oh, I got a negative ROI. Are there exceptions? <laughs> like, no, I just want a CVCT. You know, like, and like, or I mean, that's that that might be outside of the scope. But let's say I do this, and I have exceptions in ROI. Should I kill it? I mean, what do I do? Well, there's some rules of thumb. You have to give it long enough to actually perform. I mean, new marketing takes a while to get traction. Let's say you're doing Google Ads. Google um, will spend your budget really quickly in the first couple of weeks and give you this big pop in performance. And then they'll actually intentionally slow it down until you prove that the marketing you're doing is going to have the same kind of impact, that, that it's going to attract a lot of people, that they're going to want to click on your ad and stay with you. And so you can't measure your ROI just like the first month. Everything takes time to get rolling, whether it's the marketing source that is kind of uh, dragging its feet on you like Google is, um, or if it's just people have never been exposed to your brand before in this particular venue and they've got to get used to seeing you over and over and over again. I mean, we've talked about it. The old rule is somebody has to see your brand or your ad or your message nine times before their brain even recognizes that they've seen it the first time. Like they could drive past your billboard nine times in a row. They could see it on their commute every single day. And it's not till like the ninth or 10th time that they go, oh, look at that billboard. Like yeah. It doesn't sink in. So you got to give marketing time to see the ROI. I like to see it over a year. Okay. And I know that's a long time to be patient. It is. It is. But sometimes you have to. Okay. So let's go there. So I have to see things. I'm not the smartest guy. So I see things I heard, you know, I've heard about these solo stoves, like the solo backyard, you know, fire pit and everything. And then I saw it. My wife's aunt had one. I'm like, oh my gosh. And then I clicked on one and it kept following me around the internet. So every time I opened Instagram, there it was. I'm like, you guys are stalking me. And then I bought one and I'm like, this is the greatest thing ever. But the, the evolution of that, let's go to, are, are we talking about impressions here? You know, cause I, we talked about CPL, we've talked about CPA, 
ROI, and then what about CPM, cost per thousand impressions? Because that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, is that what you're talking about in like how frequently we have to make sure somebody sees this message or just being consistent overall? Well, to an extent, because some of those can be hard to measure. I mean, a billboard, they could legitimately tell you how much traffic goes past it in a day. Right. So you can see how many impressions you get. Um, and with things like paid advertising with Google, you absolutely are going to know exactly how many people saw your ad, how many impressions there were. Um, typically, your, you know, your, your cost of an impression is one of those lower metrics that you measure just to make sure you are getting enough awareness. Usually I look at it for a particular marketing strategy, but you're right. We could add the entire thing together and say, is there enough awareness of what we're doing? Is it getting enough eyeballs in order for us to actually turn those impressions into leads and ultimately appointments? Okay. So if you're this far into the podcast, you already know your brain hurts. And <laughs> Sometimes you just kind of like, help me with this. Okay, we still haven't covered a couple of things though that I want to talk about. And one of them is, you hear this all the time. What's a new patient worth? Like, you've got a metric around that because I'm going to be investing money. We're going to be talking about impressions. We're acquisition. Ultimately, what's the value of a patient to a practice? You have a name for that. What do you call that? So that's a, it's called in marketing, customer lifetime value. So it, it could be patient lifetime value, but typically it's CLV is how it's referred to in the industry. And it's ultimately how long is that person going to engage with your brand and give you money? So there's a couple of basic things we know. We know that the average patient is worth 800 to a thousand dollars a year. We also know the average patient stays in a practice for 10 years. And ultimately, if you had, let's say your cost of acquisition for this patient was like $300. Okay. And that patient is worth $8,000, $10,000 because they've stayed in the practice for 10 years. When you look at the ROI of that single patient, all of a sudden you have like 2,600% ROI if you've kept them in the practice, which is why that new patient reappointment rate is everything there's this so there's this thing that we do and I, I love this you know we've talked about smart market before one of the things i love about it is when i've got a call tracking number specifically say for a website or a google ads campaign and we keep that active for a couple of years we can see the roi of not just the new patients who came in but the patients who came in last year as a result of that marketing and spent money this year and then spent money the year after that and if you watch it the roi is amazing like for example seo first year it might be like 300 percent roi okay that's fine you know not bad it was worth my money the next year it's like 800 percent roi and the year after that is like 1700 percent roi and the year after that so it keeps growing because those dollars you spent in the beginning just keep paying you back again and again and again right this so this is the, the golden goose that we need is the customer lifetime value. Yeah. Now you're, you know, I hope if you're listening or, or watching, you're understanding why you watch a major league baseball game or anything. And you just see metrics everywhere because it helps you make really good decisions. I would also add too, because we see the same thing on our other side. People don't often understand in a dental practice. It's not everyone's going to buy all the dentistry in the first appointment. Sometimes they don't know any better. They've come from another state, you know. And the fact that they come to your practice and yes, you're a comprehensive dentist and you're great trust takes it takes some time. Their life circumstances also change. They might be like not ready for dentistry. And then a year later, two years later, this is where if you know the metrics, you can start to say this is now what are the thing we're not talking about that you mentioned at the beginning is this. Your favorite days as a dentist are when you're starting to connect with the people that have the same value system as you. Now you can put up this extra dial and say, this is the type of patient, you you always coach this, like personas. Mm -hmm. So I know you didn't put this in here, but I think it's really important that you know the persona. You even give them names. Can you just talk about personas a little bit and how we put this in the mix? I know this wasn't part of the formula, but it's really important to know your ideal patient. It really is. Um, personas don't have a whole lot to do necessarily with 
these uh, KPIs, but I love them because they help you identify who it is you want to go after. So we have kind of a process we'll go through with everyone that says, you know, let's think about our favorite patients in the practice, you know, and, and just have the team name three or four people that are really good patients. Like we have a good relationship with them. Um, they, they show up for their appointments on time. They always pay their bills. They refer people to us. These are our ideal patients. And then you start to document what their demographics are. So how old they are and where do they live and what kind of thing do they do for a living? Are they professional? Are they working class? You document all of these types of things. And then in order to bring that data to life, I love to give it a name. So like we will literally name that persona and maybe that persona is Mary Beth because she is one of those patients. So as soon as you say, we're trying to find more Mary Beths, you know exactly who it is you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even in our business, we have Plateau Patty, you know, people that have, you know, it's, it's a young female dentist who's just, I'm stuck. Like I'm just stuck. I need, I know it could be better. I have a good practice, but I just know it could be better. And so putting all these pieces together, at least you know what you're looking for when you start putting out the message in the world. And um, it just makes life better in that respect. Now I do, I know I only get you for so many, so many minutes and I have so many more questions I want to ask you. One of the things I want to start putting this all together. So when we talk about customer lifetime value, Donnie, help me make sense of this. So I got my customer lifetime value. I'm getting a sense of that. How do I put all of this together and start playing with the levers so I ultimately get better ROI? Well, this is kind of where we talked about the critical few. You can't do all of this all at one time. It'll make you crazy unless you have one person in your practice who just loves to do this. So the first thing I would say is pick four or five primary numbers that represent success for you, whether it's new patients, new patient reappointment rate, gross production, whatever it is, just pick like four or five of them get into the habit of recording them once a month. I usually don't say doing it unless it's a number that changes dramatically week to week. Once a month is plenty because you're, you're going to need time to see the trends. So get used to that first. Yeah. Then you start looking at, okay, what are the things that are influencing these KPIs? And that could be your marketing and what is the cost of acquisition and the cost per lead. It'll grow from there. I mean, I, there isn't a perfect formula. And frankly, most practices don't do this. They have a marketing company that does it. And, and I hate to say it, but most marketing companies are not measuring all of these things. They just measure how many times the phone rang. Or they're measuring how much money they got from you last month. So <laughs> I don't know. No, I just... <laughs> And say that, but like, I think, um, um, you know, when you put all these together, the first thing is being aware. You don't always have to fix them, but like you've done with us, I'm like, oh my goodness, I did not know that. You know, then you start to say to yourself, well, what do I do about what I didn't know that I now know now? And now you can start the path. It just makes it a less, I like the idea of it's less emotional. Mm hmm and less intuitive because I'm like, oh, and my team will be the first to tell you, oh, here he goes again with his ideas, you know? So I think it's it's awesome that you're grounded in actual data. Now, any last thoughts you have on acronyms for practice success that we haven't covered already? I think we have covered all of them. And my guess is everybody's head is swimming when it comes to all the letters of the alphabet. Just pick a couple of key KPIs that represent success for you. And then the most important thing you can do is focus in on your critical few. Pick two of them to work on over the next six months that you can have some impact on, that you can put all of your laser focus on. That is the thing that is going to move you towards success so that you can get better and better and better at these other things we've talked about. Yeah. Now I know everybody's head is swimming, but we're going to throw them a lifeline or some type of, uh, you know, some type of thing to make them float a little bit. I want you to talk about um, what you guys do. You guys actually, Zanya, you guys have Smart Market Dental where it you take the, the laborious aspect out of it. You guys actually measure this. Talk about what your company does, what your software does, and how you guys use that. So, um, 
like I mentioned in the beginning, we're a full service marketing agency, very strategy driven and strategy requires numbers. So we use Smart Market Demo, which is something uh, we built ourselves probably about three and a half years ago now. And it connects to your practice management software so that this is all completely automated. So if we have a tracking phone number that we use on one piece of marketing or a different tracking number on a different piece of marketing, I can then literally automatically correlate this patient came from this source, turned into this amount of treatment value, turned into this amount of actual production and collections. And all you do is drop in the cost and we know all of these numbers instantly. It just, it makes it so much easier to make a really smart marketing decision. It, it, you got to be working with somebody who is driven by the numbers. I know I'm prejudiced towards that, but the numbers are going to make the doctors feel like it creates trust. It also creates, by the way, complete transparency. If your agency is not showing you numbers like this, it doesn't hold them accountable any more than it holds you accountable. Right. At the end of the day, it's always going to be about results and like, are we moving you know, mutually in the same direction. So this is awesome. Zanya, you're the best. Thank um, you. I really appreciate you. And so if you're listening to this and you're struggling with marketing, this is your person. She's awesome. And she's not only she is awesome, but the rest of your team is great. Just answering questions. Um, you did an awesome class for us two weeks ago in Actental U. If you want to learn more, check that out. Reach out to her team at goldenproportions.com. Um, and we're going to have you back again and again and again with more things to decode the dental marketing journey. So stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else here. But uh, thank you guys for tuning in to the Best Practices Show. I hope you enjoyed today. And if you did, do us a favor. Just hit the share button. Share it with your friends. Uh, keep sending us suggestions for things that you guys would like to see on the podcast and we will line them up. You're going to see we've got an incredible lineup of some of the very biggest names in all of dentistry. I can't even believe I've got some of these people to say yes. I'm actually kind of nervous about it. So it's going to be fun. And you'll see that coming out in the next couple of weeks. So make sure you subscribe. And until we see you next time, keep watching the best practices show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. See you, Kirk.